The Mastery of Destiny by James Allen Chapter 3 Cause and Effect in Human Conduct It is an axiom with the scientists that every effect is related to a cause. Apply this to the realm of human conduct, and there is revealed the principle of justice. Every scientist knows, and all men believe, that perfect harmony prevails throughout every portion of the physical universe, from the speck of dust to the greatest sun. Everywhere there is exquisite adjustment. In the sidereal universe, with its millions of suns rolling majestically through space and carrying with them their respective systems of revolving planets, its vast nebula, its sea of meteors, and its vast army of comets traveling through illimitable space with inconceivable velocity. Perfect order prevails, and again, in the natural world, with its multitudinous aspects of life and its infinite variety of forms, there are the clearly defined limits of specific laws, through the operation of which all confusion is avoided and unity and harmony eternally obtain. If this universal harmony could be arbitrarily broken, even in one small particular, the universe would cease to be. There could be no cosmos, but only universal chaos. Nor can it be possible in such a universe of law that there should exist any personal power which is above, outside, and superior to such law in the sense that it can defy it or set it aside. For whatsoever beings exist, whether they be men or gods, they exist by virtue of such law, and the highest, best, and wisest among all beings would manifest his greater wisdom by his complete obedience to that law which is wiser than wisdom, and than which nothing more perfect could be devised. All things, whether visible or invisible, are subservient to, and fall within the scope of, this infinite and eternal law of causation. As all things seen obey it, so all things unseen, the thoughts and deeds of men, whether secret or open, cannot escape it. Do right, it recompenseth. Do wrong, the equal retribution must be made. Perfect justice upholds the universe. Perfect justice regulates human life and conduct. All the varying conditions of life, as they obtain in the world today, are the result of this law reacting on human conduct. Man can, and does, choose what causes he shall set in operation, but he cannot change the nature of effects. He can decide what thoughts he shall think, and what deeds he shall do, but he has no power over the results of those thoughts and deeds. These are regulated by the overruling law. Man has all power to act, but his power ends with the act committed. The result of the act cannot be altered, annulled, or escaped. It is irrevocable. Evil thoughts and deeds produce conditions of suffering. Good thoughts and deeds determine conditions of blessedness. Thus man's power is limited to, and his blessedness or misery is determined by, his own conduct. To know this truth renders life simple, plain, and unmistakable. All the crooked paths are straightened out, the heights of wisdom are revealed, and the open door to salvation from evil and suffering is perceived and entered. Life may be likened to a sum in arithmetic. It is bewilderingly difficult and complex to the pupil who has not yet grasped the key to its correct solution. But once this is perceived and laid hold of, it becomes as astonishingly simple as it was formerly profoundly perplexing. Some idea of this relative simplicity and complexity of life may be grasped by fully recognizing and realizing the fact that, while there are scores and perhaps hundreds of ways in which a sum may be done wrong, there is only one way by which it can be done right, and that when that right way is found, the pupil knows it to be the right, his perplexity vanishes, and he knows that he has mastered the problem. It is true that the pupil, while doing his sum incorrectly, may and frequently does think he has done it correctly, but he is not sure. 
his perplexity is still there, and if he is an earnest and apt pupil, he will recognize his own error when it is pointed out by the teacher. So in life, men may think they are living rightly, while they are continuing, through ignorance, to live wrongly. But the presence of doubt, perplexity, and unhappiness are sure inclinations that the right way has not yet been found. There are foolish and careless pupils who would like to pass a sum as correct before they have acquired a true knowledge of figures, but the eye and skill of the teacher quickly detect and expose the fallacy. So in life there can be no falsifying of results. The eye of the great law reveals and exposes. Twice five will make ten to all eternity, and no amount of ignorance, stupidity, or delusion can bring the result up to eleven. If one looks superficially at a piece of cloth, he sees it as a piece of cloth. But if he goes further and inquires into its manufacture, and examines it closely and attentively, he sees that it is composed of a combination of individual threads, and that, while all the threads are interdependent, each thread pursues its own way throughout, never becoming confused with its sister thread. It is this entire absence of confusion between the particular threads which constitutes the finished work a piece of cloth. Any inharmonious commingling of the thread would result in a bundle of waste or a useless rag. Life is like a piece of cloth and the threads of which it is composed are individual lives. The threads, while being interdependent, are not confounded one with the other. Each follows its own course. Each individual suffers and enjoys the consequences of his own deeds, and not the deeds of another. The course of each is simple and definite, the whole forming a complicated, yet harmonious, combination of sequences. There are action and reaction, deed and consequence, cause and effect, and the counterbalancing reaction, consequence, and effect is always in exact ratio with the initiatory impulse. A durable and satisfactory piece of cloth cannot be made from shoddy material, and the threads of selfish thoughts and bad deeds will not produce a useful and beautiful life, a life that will wear well and bear close inspection. Each man makes or mars his own life. It is not made or marred by his neighbor, or by anything external to himself. Each thought he thinks, each deed he does, is another thread, shoddy or genuine, woven into the garment of his life. And as he makes the garment, so he must wear it. He is not responsible for his neighbor's deeds. He is not the custodian of his neighbor's actions. He is responsible only for his own deeds. He is the custodian of his own actions. The problem of evil subsists in a man's own evil deeds, and it is solved when those deeds are purified. Says Rousseau, Man, seek no longer the origin of evil. Thou thyself art its origin. Effect can never be divorced from cause. It can never be of a different nature from cause. Emerson says, Justice is not postponed. A perfect equity adjusts the balance in all parts of life. And there is a profound sense in which cause and effect are simultaneous and form one perfect whole. Thus upon the instant that a man thinks, say a cruel thought, or does a cruel deed, that same instant he has injured his own mind. He is not the same man he was the previous instant. He is a little viler and a little more unhappy, and a number of such successive thoughts and deeds would produce a cruel and wretched man. The same thing applies to the contrary, the thinking of a kind thought, or doing a kind deed. An immediate nobility and happiness attend it. The man is better than he was before and a number of such deeds would produce a great and blissful soul. Thus individual human conduct determines, by the faultless law of cause and effect, individual merit or demerit, individual greatness or meanness, individual happiness or wretchedness. What a man thinks, that he does, 
what he does, that he is. If he is perplexed, unhappy, restless, or wretched, let him look to himself, for there and nowhere else is the source of all his trouble. End of chapter 3 Recording by Andrea Fiore